So my name is Andy Hahn. I'm a GU medical oncologist at MD Anderson. And the title of my talk today is going to be Treating Oligometastatic Prostate Cancer in the PSMA Pet Era. Here's my uh, conflict of interest statement. Uh, likely the biggest uh, disclosure is that I'm a medical oncologist and my thinking is biased accordingly. Okay, so what is oligometastatic prostate cancer? Um, the definition is metastatic disease limited in extent and number with less, the number being less than or equal to five sites of metastatic disease. It was initially defined in 1995 across all cancers, and the underlying hypothesis for this definition is that metastasis-directed therapy may be effective for this subset of patients um, and even potentially offer a cure for a small subset. Um, this is becoming a growing clinical dilemma for all of, uh, urologists, medical oncologists, and rad oncs due to uh, PSMA PET CTs. Uh, and Sean did a great job touching upon this. Uh, is it number of lesions that matter or is it the underlying biology? I do agree with Sean entirely. Um, number of lesions does not define survival or outcome with metastasis-directed therapy. As simply, is a patient with four metastases by PSMA PET any different than a patient with six? The answer is likely no. Um, and then as the our imaging has increased sensitivity, it's going to change the number of lesions, but it doesn't change anything about the underlying disease biology. And other cancers, you know, particularly looking at lung cancer and colon cancer, have proven that it's a combination of the seed, the tumor intrinsic properties with the soil, the site of metastasis that define clinical outcome. And so the determinants of both survival and my therapeutic approach um, include clinical variables. So is this a patient with de novo synchronous metastases or someone who has metachronous metastases after prior local therapy? The tumor intrinsic properties, looking at both the germline and somatic DNA. And then very importantly here is going to be patient host comorbidities that also will have a major role in influencing survival for these men. So. P As I said, PSMA PET positive conventional imaging negative disease is in my mind the equivalent to biochemical recurrence. Um, and that is exemplified in, my, in these two images. If you had this CT scan that had this very small sclerotic lesion in the vertebral body uh, with the patient with the biochemical recurrence, you'd likely just ignore it and treat them as if they were biochemical recurrence. Um, but once you have a PSMA PET CT that shows an avid lesion, you go biopsy it and you prove that it's metastatic disease, it changes the way people approach uh, treatment. And we know that men with biochemical recurrent prostate cancer live for a very long time. Um, and so the first, first Kaplan-Meier figure comes from a VA study that, and the key point here is that 20 to 40 percent of men who develop biochemical recurrence will ultimately die of prostate cancer. Um, and we know that hormone therapy can also accelerate death from non-cancer related conditions. The second figure comes from a study from Dr. Friedland back in 2005, but it just further um, emphasizes the point that cancer-specific survival is high for patients with biochemical recurrence, a la PSMA PET and positive conventional imaging negative disease. 15-year um, cancer-specific survival here was greater than 50%. This makes over-treatment a major potential issue as we shift all these patients um, into be being considered metastatic disease. So I'm going to go through two cases to highlight a number of different studies and how I approach oligometastatic PSMA PET positive prostate cancer. The first is a patient um, who is from my clinic, 69-year-old, relatively healthy, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, initially diagnosed with high-risk disease, had a radical prostatectomy performed in 2017. This was done outside of our institution. He had grade group 5 disease, seminal vesicle invasion. He got salvage radiation two years thereafter when his PSA was 0.1, um, and he got six months of ADT given outside as well. When he came to, uh, over to us, his PSA was 1.8, his PSA doubling time was three months. We got a PSMA PET CT, um, and you're looking at the back of the patient here. You can see there's a right fourth rib uh, lesion and then a right scapula lesion. We biopsied the scapula lesion and confirmed that this was in fact metastatic disease. So what's the historical standard here? And Sean highlighted this, but historical standard, um, if, it, if we're going to consider this biochemical recurrence, is intermittent ADT. You know, a study from Canada in 2012 um, that looked at uh, intermittent ADT versus continuous ADT for biochemical recurrence and showed that it was non-inferior. And again, patients lived a very long time and oftentimes did not die of prostate cancer. 
There's an alternative option that's being done more and more, which is metastasis-directed therapy to ultimately defer the initiation of hormone therapy. There's two main studies that people cite in this space. The first is the STOMP trial. The STOMP trial looked at 62 patients who had three or less lesions um, on a choline PET-CT, not a PSMA PET-CT, and they looked at metastasis-directed therapy versus surveillance. Um, and what you can see here is that metastasis-directed therapy, not surprisingly, improved um, time to initiation of ADT, and then also significantly reduced the hazard for biochemical recurrence thereafter. The Oriel study from, uh, from Hopkins um, looked at a total of 54 patients, uh, similar question, but this was less than or three lesions on conventional imaging, um, and they looked specifically at, uh, at SABR versus surveillance. Um, and in this study, very similarly, um, getting metastasis-directed therapy significantly reduced your ha hazard for a composite uh, disease progression endpoint. Now, both of these studies, in my opinion, have an inferior control arm because the control uh, for a patient with metastatic prostate cancer by conventional imaging is not surveillance. Um, it's systemic therapy. But, um, but it does make a, a good point. It really has shifted care in the United States and likely beyond. Um, I think a, a more pertinent study uh, for the modern era is the EXTEND trial, and this was um, by Dr. Chad Tang from our group at MD Anderson, so, so I'm biased there, but um, the EXTEND trial looked at the question of does addition of metastasis-directed therapy add anything meaningful into intermittent ADT in patients with oligometastatic disease? So 87 patients less than or equal to five metastatic lesions um, by conventional imaging or FDG PET that were amenable to met metastasis-directed therapy. And you can see that uh, the com combination of metastasis-directed therapy with intermittent ADT significantly reduced the hazard for disease progression by 75% compared to intermittent ADT alone. Um, and importantly, I think for our patients, um, it also significantly reduced the hazard for disease progression with eugonad testosterone levels. Uh, so these are patients who had recovered testosterone and still did better with the combination compared to uh, intermittent ADT alone. And so in my mind, this establishes metastasis-directed therapy plus intermittent ADT as a superior option to intermittent ADT alone for patients with oligometastatic prostate cancer by historical imaging. And then we saw a similar benefit in the recently published uh, ARTO trial, and this was ADT plus abiraterone plus or minus metastasis-directed therapy just published uh, this year, um, and that was in the MCRPC space. So as a medical oncologist, these patients you know, we oftentimes start with us at MD Anderson, and the question is always how much hormone therapy, how long, and I, I fully agree with Sean, the right answer is not the standard. The standard of care, if we consider this patient metastatic prostate cancer, is indefinite doublet, um, and that is massive overtreatment for these patients. Um, if we go back to saying, well, let's look at the biochemical recurrence by conventional imaging data, um, we just had a really nice presentation downstairs on the Embark uh, study, and Embark established, in my opinion, a new standard of care for biochemical re recurrence by conventional imaging, um, and this was about 1,000 men, PSA doubling time of less than nine months, randomized to three arms, ADT plus enzalutamide, so doublet enzalutamide alone as enzymonotherapy. Um, or ADT alone, and you can see that the combination of enzalutamide and, um, and ADT significantly reduced the hazard for metastatic recurrence, um, and even enzalutamide monotherapy outperformed uh, ADT alone. Now, in this study, this was done with nine-month dosing, and we don't know the answer for optimal duration of oligometastatic by PSMA PET positive. In my mind, it lives somewhere between six and 24 months based off of everything that's been presented and really taking into account other patient variables there as well. So for this case, I ended up giving this gentleman six months of ADT plus abiraterone, um, and we did SBRT to both of those lesions. Uh, at this point, his PSA is undetectable. We've stopped all treatment and we're awaiting testosterone recovery. So second case is looking at de novo presentation of oligometastatic disease. So in this case, this is like actually a gentleman from Colorado who came down to MD Anderson. He's 70 years old, his PSA is eight, he's got grade group five disease in his right prostate, and he's got this left acetabular metastasis. Um, and this is likely would show up by conventional imaging too, but it's quite evident by PSMA PET. We got a biopsy of that metastatic site to rule out 
any um, atypical variant histology, but it showed adenocarcinoma. We did tumor tissue sequencing of that and found a P10 alteration. We did germline DNA um, sequencing, and we found a pathogenic variant, but it's in a gene that's not of known significance at this point for prostate cancer. It doesn't influence our treatment decisions. So how are we going to approach this gentleman's local therapy? He has metastatic prostate cancer, de novo metastatic disease. Um, and there's a few studies that I'm sure they've been discussed here before, but that, that inform us on this. Um, the first is from the Stampede group. So this was 2,000 men, metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. Uh, ran, this was back when ADT alone was a standard of care. So they got ADT alone plus or minus radiation. You can see that for the primary endpoint, that the combination of ADT plus radiation did not make, uh, significantly improve um, uh, overall survival compared to ADT alone, and the results were consistent with the null hypothesis. Now, they had a planned post, uh, uh, post hoc subgroup analysis, and there was evidence of treatment effect heterogeneity for those patients with low burden of disease by conventional imaging. And that ultimately has been adopted and ran with in the United States and beyond, and has established AD, uh, radiation to the prostate as a, a standard of care option for these patients. Um, now, I think that there's more to this discussion, and I, I think there's more equipoise around this question of even radiation to the prostate than um, is currently being discussed. The HORAD study was published around the same time as Stampede. Um, it did not meet its primary endpoint for the unselected cohort. It looked very similar to Stampede. Um, and it was actually inconclusive in the subgroup analysis by volume. It was only positive when it was combined um, in a meta-analysis with Stampede. Piece one is our latest addition, and this is actually asking the question of a doublet, ADT plus abiraterone plus or minus radiation to the prostate. It has not been published yet, but it has been presented, and there was no difference um, for radiation. So as you'll see, I still use radiation to the prostate uh, plenty, but um, I think there's a lot of equipoise around this question still. Is there a role for prostatectomy in this gentleman? He is really healthy. He's 70 years old. He has basically no um, past medical history. Um, there's no definitive data to support um, the, uh, the role of a radical prostatectomy in a patient who has uh, de novo metastatic disease, but there's a lot of studies coming that should inform uh, or give us more answers about this question. One of those is a phase two study led by Dr. Brian Chapin from our group um, that we're just awaiting publication. It's been completed. Uh, and then there's two ongoing trials, one SWOG-1802 led by Dr. Chapin, and then the SIMCAP study led by Dr. Kim at Yale. Uh, and then what's our hormone therapy going to look like for this gentleman who has de novo oligometastatic disease? Again, standard of care would be indefinite doublet here. I still think that's overkill. I don't have a lot of data to lean on on that, but that's my opinion. Um, you know, and when you're choosing an androgen signaling inhibitor for a low volume oligometastatic disease, you're looking at either abiraterone, apalutamide, or enzalutamide. They all produce similar reductions in your hazard for death by about 30 to 40 percent. There's no role for chemotherapy for a patient like this. Um, how long would, you know, should we treat? The answer is likely somewhere between 24 months to indefinitely, since he presented with de novo metastatic disease. Um, but, um, you know, in my, for my patients, I'm offering 24 months here. Um, I'm doing 24 months of ADT plus abiraterone for this gentleman. He also got radiation to the prostate and the left acetabular lesion. His PSA is undetectable. Um, we've stopped treatment, his testosterone is recovering, and overall he's doing well at this point. So looking forward, um, there's a number of studies that are going to help us answer a lot of the unanswered questions that I brought up in my presentation. We have trials that are looking at how do we treat oligometastatic disease by PSMA PET. Um, that's the Aristep trial and Indicate trial. Um, we have a phase three, or we have multiple phase three clinical trials that are gonna, looking to confirm what Oriel and Stomp showed. I'm um, looking at uh, SABR or SBRT as metastasis directed therapy for PSMA PET positive lesions. I would argue that it's interesting that, the, again, the standard of care um, for these patients is, is, is considered radiation. It's not considered hormone therapy. It's what's the role of hormone therapy. Um, but they're going to be really informative and helpful. And then we do have those pending trials on radical prostatectomy. In conclusion, oligometastatic prostate cancer is a growing clinical di dilemma driven by stage migration uh, from PSMA PET CTs. De novo versus metachronous presentation drives treatment more than the number of lesions present, and there's a clearly an unmet need to understand the underlying biology and tailor treat, uh, treatment decisions for individual patients. 
There's roles for SBRT as metastasis directed therapy already, and there's roles for doublet uh, hormonal therapy for finite durations. We need to ensure that we're not over treating men who have PSMA PET positive conventional imaging disease. Thank you.